بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Look, if you're dying and there's no food but pig meat, okay, Allah says you can consume it. Who's going to call Allah a liar? Now the Can can anyone call Allah a liar when Allah says no? It's permissible to con. It's justified to consume pig meat. No, it's haq. It's your duty. It's your real duty. These Wahhabis say that the Shias are liars. Say why? Because of this tariyah. No, that's the, our duty. And the duties come from Allah. It's not a lie, it's our duty. Just like when there's no food and you're going to die, you're allowed to have pig meat, that's our duty. In the same way, if our lives are in, at stake, or out of fear, or for our belongings, or for any greater good, now we want to guard the religion. The truth of religion has to be preserved. And so it's, it's neither hypocrisy, nor is it lying. When people say this is all deception and lying, it's, where's the deception? It's one's duty. If you call this deception, you have to call a lot of things a deception in the Holy Quran now. The notion of being forced, because the verse said, except for one who's forced, okay, here, the notion of being forced is used in the absolute sense and thus can embrace a number of possibilities. You can be forced in many areas. It's mentioned in the absolute sense. Now here, all the com commentaries of all the denominations, they refer to this verse and uh, to the period of post-migration of the Holy Messenger when he migrated to Medina and a group, yes, they caught many of the Muslims. A group of them willing, willingly chose disbelief instead of Islam. After having believed in Islam, they're going to face their punishment. Another group were unwilling to accept disbelief. So they wanted to migrate to, but they were caught by the polytheists. Many gave in and said, no, we, we don't believe in Islam. They returned in their ways. But some were unwilling to accept giving in and, you know, to disbelief. So the polytheists, they caught a number of Muslims after the Holy Prophet had migrated, and now they wanted the Muslims to speak bad against Islam. They wanted the Muslims to blaspheme against the Holy Prophet. Yasir and Sumayya, they, they refused. They didn't accept, and, and they were martyred. Bilal refused. He was tortured very heavily. It was a very heavy torture Bilal underwent. But Ammar, the son of um, Yasser and Sumayya, Ammar, he spoke in harmony. He spoke in harmony, expression of the tongue. The heart was secure. But he spoke in harmony with the enemy's wishes. He said many things, and history has reported those things. He expressed very, what was very uncomfortable. But his life was spared. And the, the, the news spread out. Muslims speaking against Ammar, saying, oh, he, he's, a, he's become a kafir. The rumors were, you know, increasing. Just imagine how difficult this is for Ammar. And when the Holy Messenger was notified, he immediately, he, had, he, hadn't, he, hadn't, he was yet to see Ammar in person, he was first notified. When he, was, he said, Kalla, oh, definitely not. It's all rubbish. What do you mean he's a kafir? Kalla, inna Ammaran, verily Ammar, mala'a imanan min qarni elo qadami. Ammar is filled with iman from the top of his head to the bottom. Is filled with Iman. وَاخْتَلَتَ الْإِيمَانُ بِلَحْمِهِ وَدَمِهِ Iman is, um, uh, is permeated in his blood and flesh. This is Ammar. 
And finally, when they met, the two met in person, um, and Marius was, <laughs> you can imagine how difficult it is. He was very embarrassed. He did his duty, but you can imagine the embarrassment. He was in tears, and the Holy Messenger wiped his tears from his face and said, you have to do the same if they take you again. All, now all denominations, all the tafsirs of all denominations, with this verse, they bring this story. So this shows that taqiyya here was the right action. Yasir and Sumayya and Bilal, they were all praised. They were all praised. But Ammar was praised more. Ammar's action was the right action. Now there are other verses of the Holy Quran where taqiyya can be extrapolated. وَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنِ يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانَهُ I've highlighted it. The believing man from the family of Pharaoh who concealed his faith. So there was a believer. Allah's calling this man a believer. So this man has worth. Uh, when Allah, when, when the common layperson calls me a believer and then Allah calls me a believer, that, that addressed by Allah means much more. And now Allah's describing, <coughs> describing this believing man who was close to Pharaoh. See, he concealed his faith. He concealed his faith. Wait, that's one of the applications of taqiyya. So the believing person was close to the Pharaoh. And being close to the Pharaoh, he had to conceal his faith. And this taqiyya exercise, when it says concealed his faith, has been approved by Allah in this verse. And here, but the taqiyya wasn't to save himself. In this verse, remember when we said out of fear, it doesn't only have to be out for your own life, maybe the life of others. Maybe out of fear for the cause. There may be many things, many applications. Here it was to save a prophet, and that prophet was Nabi Musa and his cause. And he demonstrates a rational principle and shows the Pharaoh that he's doubtful in relation to Musa. And this is an application of Tariya. So he's talking, said, I'm not sure if this is the right thing to do, to kill Musa. That believer, the believer was saying this to the Pharaoh. He wants to, he's considering his faith, he wants to save Musa. He's talking on such lines with Pharaoh, so the Pharaoh doesn't kill Musa. And the principle is, if Musa is wrong, then it's his own loss. But if he's right, there'll be trouble ahead for you. And so you're preventing a probable but potentially significant harm. That's rationality here, dominating over one. And that's why when we say Taqiyya has its roots in rationality, it's this kind. There are seven verses, one after the other. In each verse, the, the believer is using a tactic to dissuade the Pharaoh. Why? To save Musa, whilst concealing his faith, Tariyya. Okay. So that's another story of Tariyya in the Quran. The next, the companions of the cave. وَلْيَتَلَطَّفْ وَلَا يُشْعِرَنَّ بِكُمْ أَحَدًا And let him be cautious and let no one be aware of you. إِنَّهُمْ إِنْ يَذْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ يَرْجُمُوكُمْ أَوْ يُعِيدُوكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ وَلَنْ تُفْلِهُوا إِذَانْ أَبَدًا So, when they were in the cave and then they wanted to come out after 300 and more years, they said, um, okay, you have to be very cautious now when you want to go out. Um, don't let anyone be aware. They didn't know 300 years had passed yet with the companions of the cave. They thought maybe a day or two they were sleeping. So now they thought, okay, a day has passed. Let's get out of the cave, but be cautious. Take your money with you, but don't let anyone be aware of your beliefs. Indeed, if they come to know of you, if they find out, and they come to know that you were hidden and they were after them before they went to the cave. And they, they're going to either stone you because they now know your beliefs or they're going to return you to their religion. So here it's implicitly inferred that were they to have been asked of their religion, let's say when they were walking on the streets after the whole scenario of the cave, they're coming out they were dealing with people as if they were of the same religion. 
That was their aim, that if they were to ask, just say, we have the same religion. And that was the scenario. The companions of the cave, they, even though their hearts were monotheist, even before the story of the cave, they were in the courtyard of the royal palace. They would utter expressions on a par with shirk. They would, they would do that. It's, you know, plain taqiyya. But here in this verse though, when they wanted to come out, they thought still it's the ruling authorities are still there. They didn't know 300 years had passed. So I said, be careful when you go out. They shouldn't get to know of you. So even there, that the taqiyya framework was, the, was dominating. Another thing is, we see taqiyya exercised by the companions of the Prophet. Suyuti, who is a very notable Sunni scholar, in one of his works, he brings this tradition of the ahadith, which the Shias have a lot. La dina le man la taqiyya One with no taqiyya has no religion. Now, that may be interpreted as, if you don't practice taqiyya, the end of your religion will result very quickly because you're going to be killed very quickly. Or Abu Huraira, for example, which the Sunnis are very fond of, um, in Al Bidaya wa Nahaya, it's very explicit. He does taqiyya before Omar. He said, There are some things I won't disclose when in the, in the uh, presence of Omar. And that's a form of taqiyya. He was scared of something. Or Hudayfa, he exercised taqiyya in relation to Uthman. And he said, I'd rather sell a bit of my religion than lose it all and die. What was he scared about with Uthman, the third Khalifa? In Ibn Yaqub's Tariq history, which is in the third century, it relates a story where Jawbir ibn Abdullah and Ansari, a very mighty companion of the Prophet, he was the one we, we discussed yesterday or the day before, where he met until the fifth Imam too in person. He was scared of Ibn Artad. Now this was after Muawiyah had died, but Ibn Artad was one of those who Muawiyah had assigned in you know, a position of authority. And Jawbir was scared of him. Because he was scared that Ibn Artad would force him to pay allegiance to Yazid. Okay? Now, Jawbir, look, he was looking for some advice. He went to the wife of the Prophet, Umm Salameh. So she was, you know, alive at that time. And she replied, If that's the case and you're, going, you're scared for your life, in that case, give allegiance, Umm Salameh. Verily, the companions of the cave practiced taqiyya, whereby they would wear clothes bearing the cross and would be present with them in their festivals. She gave the example of the companion of the caves, who, with the mushrikeen before the cave incident, they, the mushrikeen, this shows the cross, this cross was a sign of the polytheists. It's not a sign of Christianity. It was something which existed amongst the pagans before Christianity. And they would have a cross, and these people, Ashab e Kaf, who were monotheists at heart, they would wear those clothing with the cross, those shirk emblems, and they would participate with them in their festivals. It was taqiyya. And so you, you go and give taqiyya to Yazid, and history seems to report that he did. Or taqiyya by the Hajj pilgrims in Arafat, because Muawiyah said that you're not allowed to say labbaik before the dhuhr adhan because Amir al-Mu'minin would say it and out of spite for 70 years it was mandatory to do to curse Amir al-Mu'minin on the pulpits you have to imagine the context taqiyya may today not be as applicable as 1400 years ago but today has its own challenges I'm not saying the same nature of taqiyya is applicable, but taqiyya has many different applications. Some may be even more required today. And, well, if the Wahhabis say taqiyya is hypocrisy, well, all the companions here, well, many companions were practicing it. Umar Salama was even saying, gave this very good istidlal and demonstration to Jabir. Now, does the rule apply to all believers? 
because the verse was for all believers. When you say believers, it's prophets, it's successors of the prophets and others. Can the prophet do tariye? Well, depends. We, we answer yes, but depends on the on the which application of tariye. I can show you many applications where the prophet did tariye. If you tell me, does he do tariye in relation to la ilaha illallah? I'll say no. In relation to la ilaha illallah, prophets don't do tariye in the Quran. Most of them were killed. They went to war. They went. That's. The core, they brought the message. Its essence is la ilaha illallah. But in certain actions they did, they did out of tariyat to preserve the truth of religion. That's possible. Now, if you say, well, are you saying they did it out of fear? We say yes, but not the fear that you think. If you say the Prophet did taqiyah out of fear of the enemy, we say no, they're not scared of anyone. The Prophet's not scared of it, they're ma'soom. They're in the presence of Allah. When in the presence of Allah, why should you be scared of anything? But here, when they're acting in the world for their cause, they have to plan worldly things. Here they have fear that the cause that they're fighting for may be compromised. The cause may be compromised. This they're scared of. Because they have this worldly responsibility. They have to act, tell people to do this, you do that. So they have to do the best, choose the best plan. When Nabi Musa was defending a, a, a soldier of Bani Israel, well, a, a, a servant of Bani Israel, from a Coptic soldier, he defended the uh, Bani Israeli by hitting the Coptic soldier, the Coptic soldier died. Nabi Musa said, Dalam to nafsi, I've wronged myself. And he says he was agitated. Not that he was scared or anything. He's with Allah. He was scared for the cause. Now this, this Coptic soldier has died. The whole cause now may be compromised. And that is difficult for prophets. They think they've failed. So we shouldn't automatically think when we say that a prophet acts out of tariyah, they're scared of people. No, that's not the case. And here there are other examples of tariyah of other prophets. Let me just skip. But tariyah applications pertaining to the holy prophet. Now these are things which, um, yes, over here. This is. A bit incomplete the bottom we have, but there's a lot missing from the bottom here. This has to be amended. So here, the tariya applications pertaining to the Holy Prophet, when he started, after the revelation started, for three years, propagation was concealed. It was underground. He hadn't disclosed it. Why? Why did he keep it secretive? for three years, only in closed circles, before declaring his mission. For three years, this was secretive. If he had done it on day one, the cause would have been compromised. They would have eliminated it from its roots. This is out of tariyah. Tariyah to do what? The cause. To preserve the truth of religion. He's thinking now, this is, the, this is what we should do. Abu Talib, oh, he was a very, strong manifestation of tariyah that our poor brothers, our Sunni denomination, they, until now they think he's a kafir. Right? Because he was with the polytheists. They don't know he was doing it out of tariyah so that it can help the cause of the Holy Messenger. But the Holy Messenger's migration, when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, it was in secret. They told no one. Very limited people. Why? No one was notified. Why? It was done at night and during day, because it took many days before getting to Medina. During the day, they would go into hiding. At night, they would do the migration. Why? The route taken, well, Mecca is below Medina. So you would expect them to travel to the north of Mecca to get to Medina. But they went to the south of Mecca. They took the long route, so no one finds them. 
because they were being suspicious after Laylatul Mabid when Amirul Mu'mineen was placed there. Why was Amirul Mu'mineen placed there? Look, all these actions, it's a form of taghiyya. Hiding in the cave. Why was that done? Why, why should they hide in the cave? Or the story of the victory of the conquest of Mecca. They didn't notify anyone we're going for the conquest because of hypocrites who were present. They wouldn't, he, he would close the doors, the, the gate entrance of Medina so people can't get out and he wouldn't tell anyone they're making their journey to Mecca for a conquest and the soldiers with them, they don't know. And when one got to know and sent a message through a woman, the Prophet sent Amir al-Mu'min to stop that message getting through. So the Meccans don't know that we're coming for a conquest. And uh, now here, I, I've written one or two things, but I can't see the page now. I, yes. But I'm showing the other instances of where many actions that the Holy Messenger did was clearly out of taqiyya. Okay, it wasn't in relation to aqa'id, but the actions we see, yes. And we see this throughout the Imam's lives, especially during certain periods where they were crucifying the Shias. And to stay alive, they had to practice taqiyya. And it was difficult. Very difficult. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.